Today I'd like to talk about socialism. Uh, and first uh, we can talk about uh, aspects of equality and then Marxist socialism. And then a third step, anarchism. Uh, first, the idea of equality. And this we could define as being uh, at the complete end of private property by transforming it into public property. And so to divide uh, income equally across the entire population of a country. And essentially, this reverses the policy of capitalism, which in depends almost entirely on the concept of private property. And there is this sense of working against individualism because individualism uh, creates competition and competition over scarce resources and socialists wanted to, tra to transform that effectively to end competition amongst uh, individuals to create equality amongst all. Um, and so these members wanted to live in cooperation with one another, to be dependent on one another, and so no competition for these resources. And in that way, you could use the resources of any given society for the greatest good for all. Some of the background to this movement uh, came from uh, the French Revolution. Uh, when we hear some, for the first time, some extreme reformers calling for the end to uh, private property. Uh, we could go back even further uh, to uh, the Greek philosopher Plato and his uh, Republic or to the 16th century English writer uh, Thomas More who wrote on uh, Utopia, uh, imagining an ideal community in which everyone worked in harmony. And these ideas began to coalesce during the 18th and 19th centuries in which writers and theorists seriously grappled with an entirely new development that we've talked about, uh, which is the Industrial Revolution. And how do you come to terms with uh, the uh, use, perhaps exploitation, of workers uh, to benefit only an elite few? Uh, these writers from the 18th century and early 19th centuries were called utopian socialists. These were uh, Henri de Saint-Simon uh, is one, and Charles Fourier. They were very influential in developing early socialist thought. And they strongly uh, promoted the idea of communes, that people would come together and live often on agriculturally based communes, cooperatives, and thereby to, in a sense, escape this industrialized world that had created so much hardship for so many workers. And they stated that under these conditions, people would distribute goods and services equally, and everybody would contribute according to their own merits. Um, now, the idea of, of exploitation is, is nothing new uh, and trying to combat the effects of that exploitation, but socialists were willing to take it to an entirely different, different level and call for uh, the end, uh, not only of property, but of the entire idea of class, uh, that there would be no uh, social classes and all would remain uh, equal. And the demands for these workers began to take on uh, concrete uh, terms. Uh, they wanted better working conditions, uh, better living conditions, uh, they wanted health care, and many wanted equality across the sexes. And with the creation of unions, uh, workers found a means to try to realize uh, these ideals. Uh, le unions became legal in Britain in 1871, in France in 1884, and in Germany by 1890. And those unions were critical to coalesce ideas into concrete forms and then be able to express these to industrialists and to society as a whole. 
There is a real idealism to this movement. Many socialists believed in equality amongst the sexes, a radical idea by the 19th century. And this was especially true in Germany and in Russia. The German writer August Bebel said that men and women should abolish all private property and hence the means for competition. In his book, Woman Under Socialism, which came out in 1879, he called for the end of what he termed sex slavery and the beginning of a new social order in which men and women would be equal and would treat each other as equals. The, similarly, the German feminist writer Clara Zetkin uh, worked to further the women's movement through the Social Democratic Party. Uh, increasingly, she began turning to communism as a means to uh, achieve her, her goals and spent a lot of time in, in Russia where she eventually died. And she edited a socialist women's paper in Germany called Die Gleichheit or Equality for over 20 years, which became a kind of mouthpiece for the women's movement uh, in Germany and then to spread across all of Europe. With this idealism that was part of the movement, uh, there were also real difficulties because the idea of creating communities, typically around agricultural uh, foundations, found real hardship uh, for the workers. It was very difficult to create agricultural communes uh, in which all members um, would be would be free. Most of these communes and communes indeed uh, um, ended up collapsing. This was also the case in the United States roughly in the same time in the 19th century. Uh, there were many agricultural based uh, communes. Very few of these uh, could survive. Uh, we could perhaps point to the kibbutzim in Israel which grew out of this movement. Uh, many of those are still around um, but under a different set of political circumstances. In Europe, uh, as well as in the United States, uh, it, these kinds of utopian communities proved very, very difficult indeed to, to realize. Now, the second aspect I'd like to talk about is Marxist socialism. Uh, Karl Marx, who came from Germany, had a profound impact on the socialist movement. Uh, he began by studying philosophy in the University of Bonn and then in Berlin. And in Berlin, he became involved in radical politics. And he joined a group called the Left Hegelians, based on the ideas of uh, philosopher and, and university professor uh, George Hegel. Uh, and as uh, Marx got more involved in radical politics, he realized by the time he finished his, uh, his doctorate in philosophy, he was not going to get a job in academia, which uh, was not hiring uh, left Hegelians, as they called them. And so he got a job as a newspaper editor uh, in Germany, and then because of his radical politics had to flee, a uh, common experience for Marx, uh, and he arrived in Paris. In Paris he met a very important collaborator uh, in his future work, and that is Friedrich Engels. Engels was somewhat of a paradox. He was the son of uh, a factory owner um, and was working in Paris. His father's uh, factory was in Manchester. He was the representative in Paris, but he, he became more and more involved in socialist circles, and he wanted to improve the plight uh, of the worker. And Engels said that socialism was vague and undefined. And he and Marx would help to define it. And that is exactly what they did. They stated that in socialism, workers will rise up. They will take over the means of production, the factory, and that this will ultimately result in what they called a dictatorship of the proletariat, or the proletariat being the worker. And so the workers would be in charge, not the capitalists.
ultimately, a society goes through transition uh, from socialism uh, to communism, there will be ultimately no classes in society and workers will then be free. Um, they put these ideas together in an important manifesto called the Communist Manifesto, which came out in 1848, a time of enormous political and industrial turmoil in Europe, the 1848 revolutions. So they were right at the, the heart of that movement. And uh, their idea was that private property must be abolished. And only then can workers be free. They hold everything in common. That they certainly uh, drew from the original ideas of, of socialism. But their contribution was to make socialism concrete and understandable to the worker and thereby galvanize a workers' movement. Essentially, they argued that history is class struggle. That this is a struggle between what Marx and Engels called the bourgeoisie, or the middle class, and the proletariat, or the workers. And capitalism sharpened this struggle. Uh, Large-scale industrial production will destroy the life of the worker and their families, and this leads eventually to a propertyless worker, or a worker essentially with no power, and hence completely open to exploitation. So the competition between companies, which is at the heart of capitalism, they argued, uh, meant merely more suffering for the workers. Wonderful benefits for the elites, but nothing left over for the workers. And so they made socialism into a viable theory that was directly targeted to some of the most important events of their time. This it is, uh, essentially made socialism more scientific. And Marx set out, uh, he fled once more, this time to Britain, um, he set out to make uh, socialism, in a sense, as concrete as he could, in part through researching at the British Museum, the library uh, at the British Museum, and he created with Engels a three-volume work called Das Kapital, or Capital. The first uh, issue came out in 1867, although most of the remaining issues came out after uh, Marx's death, ushered through by his collaborator uh, Engels. And this work uh, cemented uh, Marx's um, uh, contribution to the history of, of socialism by really combining multiple sciences, uh, philosophy, political science, uh, economics, and history, in this sense being a real synthesizer, uh, to argue that uh, capitalism is ultimately doomed, and the worker must rise up together to overthrow it, uh, create a socialist state, and then ultimately communism. So with this theory in hand, workers could strive for the, the dictatorship of the proletariat and no longer be requesting a small piece of the pie, but would instead own the entire pie. Other socialists went even further than Marx and Engels, and they called for anarchism. Anarchism comes from the two Greek words, an archos, meaning against uh, authority. And through removing all vestiges of authority or the state, then workers would be free uh, from any exploitation 
that meant that they could liberate their consciences, liberate their beliefs, and through perhaps local cooperatives, uh, no one would be overseeing the individual. The individual would be free to do as he or she should do best to reach the maximum of their potential. The idea of removing the trappings of the state were not exactly new. We see uh, some roots of this in, for example, the English Civil Wars during the 17th century, which uh, unseated uh, a king, resulted in the execution of Charles I, with just Parliament ruling. Um, ultimately, that didn't work out so well. They brought back a monarch. Uh, and, uh, and it also came up during the French Revolution, uh, when, with the execution of the French king and queen, uh, French revolutionaries thought, could we do without a state altogether? Uh, in none of these cases did that, that actually come to pass, but the idea fermented and became a real source of inspiration uh, for many, I suppose we could call them radical socialists uh, of the 19th century. Basically, anarchists agreed with run-of-the-mill socialists that property is the root of all evil. So you eradicate private property and you then have the foundation for a modern uh, cooperative society. Uh, and one anarchist uh, even said that property is theft. That the ownership of one person of property means that another will have no property. And so, uh, property uh, effectively meant to own property was an abuse of authority. And anarchists were not afraid to use violence to achieve their ends. Because many argued that only through violence can you dismantle a society that uh, is so firmly in place and so firmly dependent on capitalism and private property. So, in the view of anarchists, capitalism means one lives off the fruits of others, mainly workers, and there should be uh, no interference. That, we're, that workers should be free to do as they wish, with no oversight. This comes out of an era of enormous disparities between rich and poor, of uh, conspicuous consumption in which the wealthy uh, use their newfound wealth to create fabulous houses, carriages, uh, vacations, uh, lived a life of luxury and ease, whereas those who helped to provide that luxury got essentially nothing, uh, lived in squalor, and uh, competition for the few scarce resources that, that were available. So anarchists said, remove all of this, and thereby work towards a classless society. The difference with standard socialist theory is that anarchists argued for no state. Socialists were still comfortable with some form of state that would oversee this process of ending uh, private property. One of the key uh, writers of this movement was uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Uh, Proudhon came from peasant stock. He was a, a printer, he was a writer, and in 1840 he wrote a treatise called uh, Qu'est-ce que la propriété? or What is Property? He's a French writer. And he declared 
shocking his readers. I am an anarchist. And further, property is theft. Uh, he uh, was not in favor of communism, as Marx was and Engels and their followers, because that would result in a state. There has to be a state to oversee the end of uh, property. Uh, he argued for no state at all, and no property meant that there would be no need for a state. Uh, so Proudhon found a lot of support among peasants as well as industrial workers, and particularly those who were not willing to stand on the sidelines but wanted immediate action, if necessary, by violence. Another writer uh, who was from Russia, who also had enormous influence, was uh, Michael Bakunin. And Bakunin was briefly in military school in Moscow. He dropped out. He moved to Germany. And there he became involved with the radical movements uh, in Germany, became immersed in the literature. And he wrote one of his most famous lines there, uh, deeply influenced by the ideas of anarchism. And he said, the passion for destruction is also a creative passion. That only through this process of destruction can you dismantle a state that is so firmly in place. And this proved to be uh, very influential for anarchists who said we must assassinate uh, these leaders who are intent on continually exploiting us. If you do not uh, remove these people who could only be removed, they argue, through assassination, then they will only continue to reproduce and so the process continues generation after generation. And so uh, monarchs, statesmen, uh, religious figures, because church and state were so closely intertwined in 19th century Europe, uh, these, uh, had, these people had no place in modern society, Bakunin argued. And he wrote a, a landmark text, An Appeal to the Slavs, which came out in 1848, because he felt a lot of the literature was focused towards Central and Western Europe. He wanted to direct this conversation to Eastern Europe and Russia as well, which have heavily uh, Slavic uh, populations. And he called for a counter-revolutionary force that would help to overthrow these monarchies. His target uh, was the Habsburg Empire, one of the largest and oldest of the monarchies. He argued that if you uh, freed the people of this empire, you would freed, free up uh, the Slavs, many of whom, in his view, suffered under the control of Habsburg monarchs. And he continued to write uh, to live off of his friends, um, and to continue to call for violent revolution. And he broke with Marx over precisely this issue of the state. Marx still uh, required a state to oversee reforms under a pure communist system. Uh, Bakunin said, we don't need one, and hence was fundamentally an anarchist. <laughs>